the opportunity to introduce to you the man whom the Lord has brought to us this morning to bring the Word of God to us. Uh, excited to introduce him to you, excited to hear from him in a few minutes. Brian Vickers is a professor of New Testament interpretation and biblical theology at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, just two hours south in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, while he is also uh, serving there, he is also the assistant editor of the Southern Baptist Journal of Theology. Uh, He's also the author of Jesus' Blood and Righteousness, Paul's Theology of Imputation. Uh, That's the professional side of Brian Vickers. The personal side, he's married, his wife's name is Denise, they have one daughter, loves West Virginia football. Uh, He is, uh, he's a musician, banjo if I believe, no, what is it, guitar, in a band, Let me tell you about the pastoral side and why Brian is here. Because the man is passionate about missions. The the, the joke with him and the student body, whether he knows this to be the joke or not, not that it's the joke per se, is that when you go into class that you've enrolled for, New Testament interpretation, biblical theology, whatever the particular class might be, you never know if that day's class will be on that assigned material or if... Brian will just launch into a discussion about missions and the nations. Why? Why does he do this? Because he's passionate about it, and he's personally involved in it. One of his particular passions is leading mission trips around the world, particularly into places of unreached people groups, in difficult spots, ministering to the Christians there, teaching in places where they don't have easy access like we have here in abundance in the United States. And... uh, I wanted to have the opportunity for us to be pastored this morning by somebody who shares the same passion we share, and that is for the glory of God to be known to the nations. We certainly enjoy that and relish that ourselves as people who know that in our country, but we're not under the illusion that the same freedom and access and opportunity that we have is the same thing to be found around the world. And so I've asked Brian to come, and as he'll do so in a few minutes, and to just pass us, just, just, just present to us and preach to us, and just, again, fan the flames of our hearts as God would do whatever he would do in our hearts. And we're going to be a church who are not only passionate about supporting and, and sending, but also going, going. And you know, it's been a passion of mine and will continue to be. Before we have that opportunity, I want us to pray, and I want us to pray in light of what I've been reading in Psalm 104, so if you would, please pray with me. Lord, we've watched a video about it. We've sung songs about it. We've already read Scripture about it. Your Word is true. You are very great. You are clothed in splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent, laying the beams of your chambers on the waters, making the clouds your chariot, riding on the wings of the wind, making your messengers winds and your ministers a flaming fire. Who who is like you, Lord? There is no one that shares this description. Only you have set the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. You have covered it with deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they took to flight. The mountains rose. The valleys sank down. The place that you appointed for them, you, God, set a boundary that they may not pass so that they might not again cover the earth. God, you are majestic, powerful. But the reality is, we are born into sin. We are at enmity with you. We are separated from you. We we are sinful in our very nature. Therefore, in relationship, we are separated from you. 
God, your, your power and your majesty is also seen in your mercy that you would reconcile us to you, that, that while we were yet sinners, Christ would die for us. What love is this? What mercy is this? What kindness is this? Father, we worship you for the provision of your Son as a substitute for us, who would both be a substitute in His righteousness that we can never claim in and of ourselves by our own doing, and in His suffering that we will never receive because He took upon Himself the wrath that we deserve, that all those who would believe in Him and the power of His resurrection would be forgiven of sins. And God, we praise You for that. This is the fuel behind our missionary zeal, Father, to tell others about this great and amazing news. God, the glorious one, saves sinners. And that's us. How you love the world. How your love for the world is not with a particular ethnic group, not with a particular place. It is around the world and how you are surprisingly, knowing our own indwelling sin, using us to be ambassadors for the gospel. Father, we thank you for this weekend already. What a joy it's been. God, we pray your blessing upon the Coppolas. We pray as they are returning soon to Cambodia. We pray your blessing upon them, Lord, as they transition, re-engaging, Father, in the ministry that they have had for years. Father, we thank you for our brother Brian and his wife, the Friesens, Lord, North Carolina, how you've used them around the world in Japan and Philippines and now in North Carolina to train and to equip and to multiply and send people. Father, we thank you for the Stevens and what they're doing in the far places of Mongolia. Father, we pray for their visa, their their, their medical issues to be addressed, Father, that they might be able to return to where they have had such fruitful ministry over so many years. Father, we thank you for the Parlados. We thank you for even the gift of Amy being able to be here with us surprisingly, Lord, and how her and her husband are laboring faithfully, not being reported in biographies, not being known on websites, not being traveling to to have their autographs be given, but Father, how they'll go into Laos and they'll go into places and they'll share the gospel and they teach others to share the gospel and they'll live well and they'll die well. We thank you for the winces and what they're doing in Turkey. Father, for how they're glad to be accursed for you. Whether it's the curse of being an American or the curse of being a Christian, but their strong belief in the power of the gospel to change. And how fundamentalists, Islamic fundamentalists, are now leaders in churches because the power of the gospel Father, we thank you for Arja Walters and her passion for the Muslims, her love for them. We even pray your blessing upon her upcoming marriage, her soon transition. Father, we thank you for the garrisons who model for us what it means to live for the gospel and say they would gladly give themselves to help others in the gospel work. We think about their partnership with the Doolittles in Israel. Father, we think about the children who are hearing the gospel taught to them all of which come from Muslim families, the entire school from Muslim families, but are hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ and the generational blessing that will come because of their faith in Christ. Now it's changing entire households. Father, but this is but a sampling of not only the work you're using us to partner and do, but are going on around the world. So how can we not but be excited, be committed, be leaning into you by faith, God, I pray for what's about to take place, the teaching of your word, the challenging of our hearts, the redirecting of our passions, the opening of our hands. Father, mature us so that you might multiply us for your namesake, that it might not be about the name of Castleview Baptist Church, but it'd be about the name of Jesus Christ, the Savior. In his name we pray, amen.
Well, good morning. Glad to be here. Love and West Virginia football. Talk about love in hard places. That's actually, it's proof of election because nobody would choose that. Um, you, have to, you have to be born to it. And that's how, that's how I came by it. I was, I'm from West Virginia. I grew up there. And uh, still spend a lot of time there when I can. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm so thankful when Eric contacted me, though I can't remember how it is that he found me. Um, and I started to ask him this morning, but the last time I spoke at a conference, I, this is all, the whole thing I'm getting ready to tell you is the truth. It's bad when you have to start, that, start out that way, right? <laughs> Unlike all the other stuff I'm going to say. No, but so, <laughs> so last time I was at a conference, I was, I was there, and I'm not going to say who, but the, the, the other speaker was really, really well known. And there was this big poster, and he was on there, and then I was on there, and um, so I'm feeling kind of good, you know. And uh, I get there, and I'm I'm getting ready to speak, and uh, the guy, the guy who introduces us gets up. I'm I'm going first. He gets up and says, "We're really grateful Brian could be here." Of course, we had scheduled his colleague Tom Schreiner, who had to cancel, and so we're really glad that we could find Brian. He could fill in for him at sort of the last minute. And so I'm sitting there with my teeth like praying. Lord, it's not about me. Lord, it's not about me. Lord, And so I didn't want to ask Eric in case I have to sort of go through the same thing again this morning. Because <laughs> it, it's, <laughs> it's likely true. Uh, and what he says is true. I do, uh, I do teach at Southern Seminary. I put this on. It's, oh, corduroy and elbow pads. Couldn't be more typical, I guess. It's not planned. It just happens. Right? I mean, it really, I mean, you just walk around Southern, you look around and think, nobody really plans, this, this is just what happens. Just comes with the territory. But anyway, that's enough about me. Let me ask you a question. Who's here for missions? All in favor of missions? Yeah, some of you. Okay, that's good. I think maybe all of you. I didn't expect anything different. Anybody opposed? No? Okay, good. Motion carries. I think I went through the right steps. I don't know. I've only ever led one Baptist business meeting, and I botched the whole thing. I was never asked to do it again. I think I got this one right. Well, I didn't expect anybody to say no, although there are, you know, there are some people who actually are against missions. Um, I can distinctly remember as a kid, uh, we used to drive up in the mountains a lot, and um, We'd get to the top of this one mountain, and there was never, it's just one building there. It's just a little tiny Baptist church. I mean, tiny. And uh, we'd drive by, and there was never any cars there, never anybody there. And on the sign, it said, it said the, uh, what was it, the, uh, n- the first non-missionary Baptist church. That was the name of it, of, you know, whatever. It wasn't even a town. And, uh, you know, I drove, we were driving by, and I was just a kid, and I asked my dad one day, I said, there's never anybody there. And he said, well, just look at the name. Doomed for extinction, right? And so there are a few people like that, but not most people. I mean, I mean, who's against missions? I'm not. You're not. But what do you think of when you think of missions? Maybe a, a specific calling. And that's right. I mean, some people have, some people have a specific calling to missions. Um, and we'll have a little bit more to say about that. Uh, but when we think about that, we think about somebody who is like called to go overseas. That's kind of how that's kind of how we think of it. Or maybe you think about having special gifts. You know, like if you're a missionary, if you're really called to do missions, that means you have to have a set certain set like a certain what are they, skill set, certain gifts and abilities, things you can do. And there's something to that. But I think often, you know, what we typically think of when we think of missions, we think of geography. Right? I, I think that's just basically true. If missions comes to mind, you, you think of it in terms of geography. You think of going out to the nations, and, you know, there's, that's not wrong. I mean, one thing we kind of forget, though, right, is, I mean, we're the nations, right? The gospel went out to here, came to here. It didn't start here, right? So we're just already among the nations. We don't maybe think of it that way because we, we kind of like to think of everything sort of starts here with us and then goes out, but... We're here because people went out, and that's why we're here. So we're already among the nations. But what I want to impress on you this morning, one of the things I want to impress on you this morning is 
is that missions is not simply one of the things that Christians do. It is a thing Christians do, but it's not just one of the sort of categories. It's not just one of the topics. It's not just something that some people do and then sort of others don't do. I have a good friend named David Sills. He's a um, missionary and a professor and a writer, and he basically kind of boils the Christian church down to two kinds of people. You're either a goer or a sender, and then he has sort of a third category of sort of senders who turn into goers and goers who come by. I guess, he, anyway, two people. I'm, I'm confusing it already. Two people. Two people. You either go or you send. And then, of course, there's a little bit of middle ground there, too. But missions is really what we should be all about, no matter who we are, if we think about what missions is in the Bible. Um, and sometimes I think we think of it too narrowly. Now, I'm not, I'm not, here, I'm not here to tell you if you're here and, and uh, you know, you're not getting ready to pack up and move to Uzbekistan or something like that, that you're wasting your life. Never would I come and tell you that. We've all been, we've all been to missions conferences or heard mission sermons where basically you kind of left thinking, yeah, I've kind of thrown my whole life away and there's nothing I can do about it. Right? I, can, I, can, I can distinctly remember being at some things like that. But that's not what I, that's not what I want to say to you today. And so what I want to do today is, honestly, I'm just going to tell you a little bit ahead of time, it's a little bit unusual, a little bit different than sort of a typical sermon. Um, and not because, I, not because I'm a professor, not because of anything that I do, it just is a little bit different than what I typically do when I preach on Sunday morning in a, on a, uh, in a church and probably a little bit different than what you're typically used to. In fact, when I first told Eric what I was going to do, I think I asked him five times. I said, you know, it's, it's, it's not quite like a sermon, like a typical sermon. Is that all right? And he said, that's fine. And I said, now, let me, so let me, let me just remember this about you again. It's not exactly like a sermon like you probably preach every week. He said, that's fine. Just bring it. And then he was getting ready to leave the office. And, this, and I said, okay, now really, let me explain to you one more time what I plan to do. And he said, no, really, it's fine. And then even this morning, right before I got up, I said, now you remember, right? <laughs> and so, remember, whatever get, whatever's getting ready to happen, he said it's okay already. <laughs> right? So, if, if I leave here today and you're like, man, let's not have that guy back. Just, right? There you go. You point, I'll point to the right there. So, if I, I guess if I would ask you, where do you get the idea of missions? Hopefully all of you would say, well, the Bible. And that's right. Right answer. That's right. And I bet if I pushed you a little bit more and said, okay, specifically where in the Bible? Well, you'd probably come up with a few verses. And no doubt, eventually, probably pretty quick, somebody would come up with this. These three verses. Well-known verses, right? Called the Great Commission. And I'm not here to say, now, this is what you've heard in the past, but now I'm going to tell you something new. I'm not. I'm not. There's a good reason why... When we talk about missions, this is where we come to. So I'll just, I'll just read. It's real familiar. Everybody's familiar with it. You've probably, I bet, you, I bet in the past two or three days, you've already read it at least once or twice. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Well, there you go, right? That's the, that's the big missions text in the Bible. And I think that's right. But the thing about the Great Commission is this. It's really just like the tip of an iceberg. That's a huge iceberg. And it's a huge tip of the iceberg. But what is underneath it, what under, what's underneath it is really the whole entire Bible. The whole thing. The whole thing. And I hope to, I hope to show you that in a little bit. Uh, so we can kind of get a handle on, so what, I mean, what is, what is it all about? Because the thing, the thing about the story of missions in the Bible is it's, it's not just a story like out there that we kind of know some things about or we kind of know a collection of verses about it. It's meant to be something that we inhabit. You know why? Because it's, it's God's story and that means it's our story. It is our story. It's something we're meant to live, not just know about, not just see from a distance, not just be able to tell about, which we should be able to, but to live it every day. Whether you're here in Indianapolis or if you're in India or Cambodia, if you're in Russia, wherever you are, wherever you are, we're all called to live in a particular kind of way because we're a particular kind of people. And because God has made it so that throughout all the centuries of time, 
Ever since he called one particular man out in the desert centuries and centuries ago, that things would come about this way. And that there would be kind of one big story that told all the other stories, that all the other stories kind of fit into. And so that's, that's what I want to talk to you about today. So everybody has a story. Everybody. You have a story. What, I mean, they say this all the time. What's your story? Now, usually we don't mean it in a good way, but, or what's his story, right? But everybody has a story, and we just tell stories. When you talk to people, what do you do? You talk about yourself. That's what I do, too. You sort of tell your story. Now, here's a quote from a guy that I have a lot of respect for from a book called The Bible and Missions, and he just says, we all instinctively understand the world by telling stories about it. We just do. Sometimes they're short, a couple of sentences. Sometimes they're long, drawn out, and you think they're never going to end. But we all tell stories. That's how we explain ourselves. That's how we tell who we are. That's, how we, that's just what we do. If the Bible offers a... I'm sorry about that next word. That just means real big story that, that encompasses... I'm, I, I should have taken that out, but then I'd ruin the quote. If the Bible, I, that's, just, that's a, just a scholarly way of saying a big, big story. A story of all stories, then we should be able to place our own stories within that grand narr narrative and find our own perception and experience of the world transformed by that connection. And that's kind of what I want to happen today. It has to happen to us every day. But I want us to understand that the story that we're going to talk about from the Bible is it's what we're meant to live. It's what we're meant to be. And it's what we already are if we're here today and we're claiming the name of Jesus. So in that sense, in that sense, when we think of the Bible, when we think of the Bible, we often think of it in terms of, um, you know, it's sort of, like I said, certain verses that support missions or maybe, you know, your daily Bible reading or, um, or devotional reading or Bible studies. Those things are all great, and they're all great, and I wouldn't want to take one thing away from them. But, you know, it's more than that. It's more than that. It's a story that was that takes place over centuries that claims to be one thing by multiple, multiple authors. And at the very heart of it is what we call missions from beginning to end. And like I said before, the Great Commission, the Great Commission is just a, uh, just the tip of the iceberg. I remember hearing a story about a, a missionary in India, and he was talking to an Indian, a Hindu scholar who had read the Bible. And uh, he was talking to him about it, and this Hindu scholar said, I don't understand something. I don't understand you Christians. And, of course, he said, well, why is that? And he said, well, you have this book. And this is a book that tells the story of everything in the world. It explains, like, why the world's here, where the world came from what's going on in the world, where it's going, and how everybody got here, and where they're going. It, it tells the story of everything. And yet, you never tell people about that. You just kind of tell them, give them like, you know, the Bible says do this, and the Bible says don't do that. Or the Bible says, you know, make, you know do this, or, or make this decision, whatever, and those things are, you know, those things have their place. And he said, but you know, we don't need another book of, we don't need another book of religion what we need is a book like this that tells us everything that we should think about, about how, how the world works and where the world came from and, most importantly, where it's going and how we fit in it. And that, that, I think that, uh, that kind of changed this man's life. When he, when, he heard this, when he heard this Hindu scholar who became a believer, if I'm not mistaken, when he heard him, he just read the, he read the Bible and that's what he came away with. Nobody had sort of told him to think that. Nobody kind of guided him to think that. He just read it. And that's what he came up with. But so often as Christians, we think about the Bible, we don't really think of it that way even personally, like on a day-to-day -day basis. Right? We just think of it as, 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 the, as a book, which it is a book, and we think of it as God's Word, which it is God's Word. But how often do we think of it as something that we're meant to enter into and something that's meant to shape every single thing we do so that we, if we think about anything that we do, we understand it through what God reveals in His Word. So, I want you to do me a favor. Whoa, okay, so, there it is, okay. <laughs> I want you to read this out loud with me. This is the story of the Bible in one paragraph, okay? So, just humor me, if nothing else, and read along with me. Ready? I'll, get, I'll help us get started. God created the world and created human beings who rebelled against him, 
attempting to become the one thing they could never be, that is, creators rather than creatures. And then he set about carrying out his eternal plan to redeem them through his son, Jesus Christ, and through him to create a people who would believe, obey, and worship the only true God and make his good news of life in Christ known to a world in rebellion, and finally to establish fully his kingdom in a new heaven and a new earth with Christ the King reigning forever. That's the Bible. Well, but I mean, if somebody says you read the Bible, I said, yeah, out loud. The whole thing, just the other day, right? <laughs> and so that's kind of just a thumbnail sketch of it, but that's sort of the big story of the Bible. And every time I look at that, I think of all kinds of things to change. But that's really, that's really kind of it. I'm not trying to replace the Bible, of course. But what I'm just trying to show is that it is possible to sort of put the whole thing together, to kind of string the whole thing together. And at the very heart of it, at the very heart of it, missions is right there. It's part and parcel of the big picture of the Bible. It's part and parcel of, of who we are. And so that's what I want us to see today. So let's get started here. Uh, no. All right. Usually when I talk about this, I start back in Genesis and I go for a really long time, and like Genesis 1, and, but I'm going to skip ahead today, all the way to chapter 11 of Genesis, so I don't know how much time it's going to save, but it's going to save some time. But I want to start right here because this is kind of where the story starts. If you're here today and you're a Christian, you're here because of what ha starts to happen. Of course, you know, you, could, you can always reel it back further and further and further, but I mean, sort of like you can, you can kind of like... You can kind of nail it down right here. Now, this is a genealogy. Now, you know what a genealogy is, right? That's those things you come to, like when you come to the book of Numbers, you're like you're doing a daily Bible reading plan, you're like, well, I'm done, right? <laughs> done, right? And that's how we think of genealogies. Um, but, you know, you can learn a lot from a genealogy. One of the things that genealogies in the Bible do is they are a record of God's faithfulness. Because it says, you know, this person begat him, begat him, begat him, on and on and on. And what it does, one of the things it does is it will sort of fast forward things through the Bible to show us God's been keeping his promise. Because look at all these people. Look at all these people. Like you start the book of Numbers, that's why, that's why you have all these genealogies. What it shows you is, wow, one family went down into Egypt. Now there's 600,000. That's just the men. God's been keeping his promise. And that's good to know because if you read the story... If you read the story, you can see a lot of things that sort of fits and starts, a lot of disobedience, a lot of rebellion, a lot of punishment, a lot of warnings, right? It, it looks kind of bleak. But then you get to those big lines and lists, you think, wow, God's up to something, no matter what else. And so here's one for us. This is the account of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren. She had no children. Now, bear with me for a moment. Just kind of imagine. It's not, it's, just kind of imagine you'd never read the Bible before. It's, it's the first time. And you get up to this chapter, and you read that last thing. What do you think? If you think anything, what do you think? Done with that guy right? That's the end. That's the end. He, she's barren. This is not something that's pointed out very often in genealogy, since genealogy is supposed to do what? He begat him, she begat him, he begat her, he begat him, he begat him, and on and on and on and on. This one just stops dead. The end. That's what it looks like. It looks like, that's, what it's, that's exactly what it looks like. It looks like this is, there's, no, there's no future here. There's no future for this guy, Abram, right? His story is finished. But what this verse does, what this verse does is sets the scene for God to do something just completely outlandish. Because what this does is it ends with sort of a hopeless story on the human side. It, it, that's how it ends. Abraham's got no hope. You wouldn't even think another thing about him. You wouldn't think one more thing about him except for what's getting ready to take place next. And that's the important thing. Well, you turn the page, or just keep going just a few more verses after that, and now all of a sudden you, you read this promise in a sort of a new way, just by backing up just a few verses. The Lord said to Abram, remember this is Abram, 
Barren wife, no future. Leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great. You'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That's a big promise. What do you need for that promise to come true? Kids is the answer. The one thing that Abram cannot have is what he needs. For this promise to be fulfilled. And so you see the scene is set. In the, in, in, the, in, the, in the light or in the wake of human hopelessness, the scene is set for God to do something great. And he does it. And he does it. Now, you know, what's the big deal about Abraham? Nothing really. He's just a guy from a family that worships idols. That lives over basically in kind of what we call Iran now. And that's what he did. And that's where he came from. There's nothing particular about him. Except that God singles him out. And that becomes a very particular thing. And so, he promises him this. And I can tell you what. I can prove to you that God keeps his promise to Abraham. And I'll just, you, don't, you can do this if you want. Just look around. Just look around. I'm serious. Right? If you, don't, if you sort of feel like, as the story about some guy lived out in the desert centuries ago, what does that have to do with me, really? Everything. Because you're here, and these flags are up here, and those flags are lining the walls there, and this Bible's here, everything I could keep going on, this building is here. Why? Because God kept his promise to a man out in the desert centuries ago. That's why. And that's exactly why. See, this is your story. It really is. You live this story. Your life depends on this story, and your life comes from this story. And your confession of Jesus comes from God keeping his promise that we first hear about in this story every day. And it's right there in the Bible. It's part of the big picture of the Bible. It's part of your big picture. All right, so fast forward a little bit through Abraham. Well, Abraham goes for a long time. In fact, it's about 25 years and no kids. So what, I mean, think about 25 years. I mean, where I'm from, if, if somebody knows you're praying about something, it doesn't happen like a month, somebody's going to come up, some well-wisher, is going to come up and say, you know, I don't think God's in that. Like a month. Now me, I give it like three days. <laughs> right, three days. I've been praying for three days. Nothing. God's not in this one. Well, Abraham goes 25 years. I'm sure he's probably surrounded by people who are like, you know, Abraham, God maybe has something else in store for you. But, you know, lots of things happen. 25 years go by, and Abraham's getting ready to do something. He's thinking, okay, God's not giving me a child, but I got this promise. I got this guy in my household. I'll make him my heir. And God comes and says this. Do not be afraid, Abraham. Ah, that's right. No, that's not. One more. There you go. I'm your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the heaven and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said, So shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. You know what all those stars stood for? Of course, he said, if you can count them. Again, I mean, I'm, I'll just keep saying this over and over. You. Us. This is the, these are, we're, the, we're the stars that Abraham couldn't even count. When God said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do something that you can't even imagine in the world, among the nations. Because I've got a plan, and I've made you part of it, and I'm going to fulfill it, and I'm going to do it. And he's done it. He's done it. And so we can, we can keep fast forward a little bit. So you know Abraham, he finally has a son. His son has a son. That son has 12 sons. And they go into Egypt, and that's, they become Israel, right? Well, when they come out of Israel... I know, it sounds like a big Bible lecture, I know, but hang in there. When they come out of Israel, 
God sets them up in the land. But you know, they don't really have a mission like the way we do. Their mission is to kind of stay put and be a witness to God. They're not given like, a, there's no like Old Testament great commission to go out among the nations. Now they do have a mission. They're supposed to be a witness to God. But there are pieces in there, glimmers maybe, of what's getting ready to happen. You can see it in some very unlikely characters. Somebody like Tamar, for instance. Now Tamar was a Canaanite woman who had this sort of thing with Judah, one of Jacob's sons. And she ended up having a son. And her seventh great-grandson was a guy called Salmon. Now you may have never heard of him before. And he married Rahab, who was a prostitute in Jericho who helped the Israelites out. And she was the mother of somebody called Boaz, who was the husband of a woman called Ruth, who married, who was the mother, sorry, the mother of somebody named Obed, who had a son named Jesse, who had a son named David. And so through this Canaanite woman, God starts to bring the nations in because the next time you see her is in a big genealogy that starts in the New Testament. It's the genealogy of Jesus himself that travels through Tamar and Ruth and Rahab. And you have some other Gentiles. I won't get into them too much. I'll just list them up here. But the reason, the reason we can sort of name the Gentiles on the one hand is because God had something greater in store yet for the future. But he hasn't forgotten his promise. But he's starting to bring the nations in little by little by little with these promises. And I don't have to go, I've already explained this, I don't have to talk about it too much. But this is what Israel is supposed to do. They're supposed to kind of stay put and be a witness by the way they live. Now this is still true of us. This part hasn't gone away. We're to witness to God and be, and show who God is by the way we live, by the way we act, by the way we talk, by the way we love one another. This still continues on, but there's now more to it. But this promise keeps going all the way through the Old Testament. I told you I was fast forward. This, this promise keeps going until you have these hints as you're reading in the Old Testament. As you continue to read and you, if you start to put the thing together and think of it as a big, big story, you start to see these hints about what God's going to do. Now, of course, it's all based on what he's already said. Like look at Psalm 86. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, O Lord. They will bring glory to your name. And then Isaiah in that day you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done, and proclaim that his name is exalted. I will set a sign among them and will send them, send some of those who survive to the nations, to Tarshish, to the Libyans and Lydians, famous as archers, to Tubal and Greece and to the distant lands that have not heard of my fame nor see my glory, they will proclaim my glory among the nations." For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So you see, this promise keeps going no matter what. No matter how many starts and failures, no matter how many fits and starts in the Old Testament, this promise continues on as God keeps His promise to Abram. This man, this promise, and this story keeps building. And I know, I know it sort of seems like, and I am, just throwing a bunch of Bible verses at you. But I don't expect you to remember all these Bible verses. I don't I want you to try to remember all of them. All I want you to do is sort of get a grasp of the fact that the Bible is more than our daily, daily reading plan. It's more than just some verses that are great. I mean, I love memorizing Bible verses, but it's more than that. It really is a big story that explains who we are and how we got here. So that what I want to, you know what I want to happen for myself? is when I, when I sit down to read the Bible, I think read the Bible, I want to enter into it and remind myself that this is not just a story about some people who lived a long, long time ago. But this is a story that explains everything I need to know about who God is and what God has made me to do and what, what He's provided for me to do and what He's done to save me and what He promises for the future. So that I don't just read it as just some facts and figures, or I don't just read it like as Sunday school stories, or, and I don't just read it as, you know, just sort of a piece here and a piece there, but I, 
I want it to fit together in my life. I want it to be more than just, you know, six or seven copies of different translations in, the, in my home. I want it to be something that reminds me every day of who I am. So I can be reminded of what it is I'm supposed to be doing, regardless of my gifts and regardless of my specific calling. Because those things are secondary. They're important, but they're secondary. Because if there's one big story, and if God is telling and has acted out one big story in Jesus, and we're all included in it, what it means is we all have a place in it regardless of whatever your gifts and abilities may be. It doesn't matter. Whatever you have to bring to the table, those are the gifts that God has given you, they all fit in. Why? Because it's one big story. That's why. That's why it fits. That's why you don't have to be like somebody else. That's why you don't have to, that's why when you hear testimonies, you don't have to think, man, I just wish I could have done that. But it's, you have to get a grasp, you have to get a grasp and a vision of this big story of missions and how we're here because God kept his promise. I can remember I was preaching, uh, this, another story about the mountains of West Virginia, I was preaching in a, in a, in a little tiny church in Clayton, West Virginia, which is a suburb of Hinton, which is a suburb of Beckley, which you never heard of any of those places. <laughs> and I was, you know, I, I thought I'd, I thought I'd preached a pretty good sermon, and, and uh, I was young, grr, and uh, standing at the door, and this lady comes by, she's, I mean, tears are just pouring, I was pouring down her face, and I was like, man, home run. And so, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I just admit it. I know that's not like, I shouldn't say stuff like that, but that's kind of the way I was thinking. I'm just confessing. That's kind of how I was thinking. Just ask anybody's ever preached. You don't mind getting a compliment. It never bothers you. But as my mentor used to tell me, you're never as good as you think you are, and happily, you're usually not as bad as you think you are, but sometimes you are. <laughs> um, and then he said, remember all those, like I wanted, remember all those people, like when all the ladies... And the, uh, like the retired ladies and gentlemen come out, remember, they can't hear half what you're saying anyway. So don't feel too great about yourself. But anyway, that's how he kept me humble. So anyway, this lady's going out, and I said, I said, I said, you know, I don't, I don't know, I can't remember what I said. And she was just crying. I was like, well, the Lord bless you, sister. And she said, you know, and I had been preaching on missions. And, and actually, I was preaching on how everybody's life matters and how every, everybody does the work of the Lord. And that your labor is not in vain for 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 58. Therefore, beloved brother, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I've been sharing with the church that this isn't just for pastors. Paul isn't writing to a pastor's conference in, in, in Corinth, right? He's not just speaking to people in full-time ministry. And, and so I thought, you know, I mean, I've really connected with this woman and like changed her life. And she comes up and said, all I can think about is how I had a chance to go into missions when I was 15 and didn't do it. And all that sort of pride and all that stuff that was welling up with me just was crushed for good reason. But you see, the thing was, is in, in, spite, of the, I mean, I'm, in spite of the fact that I had preached the opposite of that, what she was spring-loaded to hear because of a life of regret, because she didn't do something that she could have done but didn't, it just brought it on. She, and she viewed her whole life as a failure because she didn't go somewhere geographically. But yet she had been a, she had been a, a faithful witness in this community for something like 85 years. She had hardly never even left that county, but she had ministered to people. She'd been there for people's births. She'd been there for people's deaths. Um, she was always the first one there. Somebody's sick. She was faithful every week, shared the gospel with her friends, took care of her family, raised her children, raised her children faithfully, faithful to her husband. She lived a God-honoring life all those years. But she, is sort of, she was sort of thinking that, like her, that what makes her life matter is her specific geography. But what makes her life matter is she's part of that big story of missions, even though she never left her county in some county in West Virginia that none of you will ever even visit. But her, that life wasn't wasted on God. That white life wasn't missed by God, even though she stayed put. And she did her, took part, she'd played her part of the Great Commission right there where she was from. Well, I've got to go fast. So in the Bible, it goes from Adam to the nations, to Abraham, to Israel, and then finally to Jesus, and then out to the nations. And this, whoa, hold it. Too much technology for me, I think. Okay, 
look. <laughs> All right. Now you have to imagine the scene here. You're familiar with this because of every Christmas. But you have to see the drama in this. Now, here's some little couple from where? Nazareth. What's Nazareth? It's like the West Virginia of Israel. That's what it is, right? I mean, who comes from Nazareth? Can, I mean, remember Philip? Can anything good come from Nazareth? And of course, all the other disciples are like, well, no, not really. I mean, we all, know, we all know what that place is like. But nevertheless, there is this Nazarene here that we need, you need to see. So you have this couple, and really they're from Bethlehem, right? But not everybody knew that. But they're just a normal couple. They're young, but they're nobody. They're not, they're not like a prince and a princess or a king or a great biblical scholar or a, you know, great, one of the great sort of uh, Pharisees or, or Sadducees. Nobody in power. Just a normal couple that didn't stand out in any way, shape, or form if you had known them. And all kinds of these great big events have to take place. Like an angel comes and speaks to this young girl and says... Behold, Mary, favored of God. And then goes on to make this promise about what's going to happen. The Holy Spirit's going to come on you. You're going to conceive. And to Joseph, you're, you'll name your son Jesus, Emmanuel, for he'll save his people from his sins. And that's a lot to take in. And they go into the temple. It's time to have this child circumcised according to the law, eighth day. And there's this man in the temple named Simeon, and he's been there years and years and years and years, waiting and waiting and waiting. And all of a sudden, this couple walks in with a baby. Now, this is not a baby with like a halo and, you know, like an aura around it that's just, that's a baby doing all the stuff that babies do. Otherwise, he's not a real baby. And if he's not a real baby, we're in trouble. But he's a real baby. And this couple from nowhere comes in with this little tiny baby. And this man, Simeon, because he understands the story of the Old Testament. And he understands it's not just a collection of verses. It's a story that's going somewhere and that God keeps his promises. He picks up a little tiny baby. And he says, my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. In a baby. He sees it. Why? Because he understood the story. And he understood the story had come to its fulfillment in this little tiny baby he held in his hands. And his father and mother marveled. I bet they did. Right? That's a lot to take in. But it was in that little baby that Simeon, this old man, who had done nothing basically but wait and wait and wait and wait, he saw it all take place. And he knew that that was part of his story. And he knew that was the story of his people, Israel. And he knew this is the story for the nations. This is what's going to count for the nations. Because God made a promise way, 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 way back in the past to Abraham. And we've been waiting for him to keep it. And he keeps it in the form of a little tiny baby. And he, this is what he says. And Paul says something similar. Now, the promises were spoken to Abraham, right? Just like we saw earlier. And to his seed, he's not saying to seeds, he's referring to many, but rather to one. And to your seed, that is Christ. Because all those promises have come together in the person of Jesus Christ, God incarnate. So that what? So that moving from Abraham to Israel, who then, because of punishment, goes off into the nations, they come back. And all that centers back in on one person. Why? Because it's going to come in on that one person, Jesus, God incarnate, and then explode out into the nations. Where we're going to get this. I won't read it again. The Great Commission. What's Jesus telling the disciples to do? Go tell people God kept his promise to Abraham. How are the nations blessed? By hearing the gospel. How did God, when God said all the nations would be blessed through you, how? Through the message of God keeping his promise. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's how I'm trying to, that's what I'm trying to show you. I'm not saying that this is all the Bible's about. I mean, there, this is just one piece of it. But this is one piece that 
it holds it together. And lots of things hold it together. This is one big thing that runs from beginning to end in the whole thing. So after the cross and resurrection, Jesus is teaching the disciples, and he's standing there on the, on the mountain, or on the mountain, and they say, it's now the time you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel. And uh, he says, it's not for you to know the dates and times, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. This is, one of the, last, this is the last thing he ever says to them. And it's not because they're just completely confused. I mean, this is a good question. And of course, you know the story, right? Jesus, Jesus goes up in the sky and the, the disciples are looking up. But it's not because they're, you know, sort of dummies. That's what you do when somebody rises up into the air. I promise. Right? I mean, we get, we, we get all over the disciples. Well, they just stand there. With their head. Well, of course they do. If, if I shoot off a bottle rocket, all of you are going to look up, much less a person going up into the clouds. Of course you look up. That's what you do when people ascend into heaven. You look up, right? So let's ease up on the disciples a little bit. Now, of course, they're still standing there, and I would too. I would still be there. And, of course, the angel comes and says, hey, fellas, this way, down here. Which, you know, he's just sort of snapping them back into reality a little bit and says, look, just go. This same Jesus, you will see him come again. Now go into Jerusalem like he told you. And what happens? Well, I'm, I'm almost there. Just hang in there with me for just a little bit longer. And so he says, go on in to Jerusalem. And then what happens? Well, they're meeting one day. And all of a sudden, things start to shake. And things start to get out of the ordinary. And they see something that looks like flames, flaming tongues and things start to descend. And what's going on? God's getting ready to go to the nations. Because he's, now, now you see, and this is what makes it different. This is what makes our part in the story different. Is because now we have a message and empowerment to share it. And, imp- and the message itself is empowered to give life. And that's what, that's what we were waiting. That's what, was, that's what we're waiting on throughout the history of Israel. Was this message that comes with power. And what happens? They go out and start speaking and people hear it. What? In their own languages. Hearing what? The Great Commission. God keeps His promise to Abraham. This Jesus, who you killed. God God raised Him up from the dead for the forgiveness of sins. And they all start to hear it. And what do they start to do? They start to share it. Why? Because that's what you do with stories. That's what you do when you think a story is great, and you think it's a good story, and you think it's an exciting story. You tell it. Now, what if you think about the fact that you inhabit it and you live it and it's your story? How much more then will you want to share it with others? Not because it's just, hey, let me share this story with you. It becomes, let me share my story with you. And it turns out it's not just my story. It's God's big story. It's what God's been up to. And, of course, this is what they do. Now, here's the whole book of Acts in one slide. And Jesus said, you know, Jerusalem... Samaria, all the ends of the earth. And that's what they do. The book of Romans ends with the first, the greatest missionary and greatest theologian in the history of the Christian church all came together in one person. That was the Apostle Paul, right? He brought both of them together. And he's in jail. It looks like failure, right? On, the, on one level, like on the, on the outside, like the world level, you think that guy's in jail. And Paul's saying, hey, guess what? I'm in jail, but I'm getting ready, I'm getting, I'm getting the opportunity to speak to the whole Praetorian Guard. Who's that? Those are the guards that you couldn't even get close to. That's like Caesar's own personal guards. Nobody has access to them. Nobody. They couldn't hear the gospel. No, I mean, you just can't get close to them. But Paul could. Why? Because God put him in jail after he'd gone all over the place. And Paul says, I'm here preaching the gospel unfettered. He's in prison, unfettered, every day, preaching the kingdom. And because of my imprisonment, people are emboldened to do what? Go share the story. That's what. And that's what happens. Just a little overview. We don't need that again, though. All right, so here's the story continues. Because that story doesn't end with Paul in prison. Now, the canonical part of it does, but that story continues on. Now, I'm just going to tell you right off the bat, 
Matt Chandler, pastor in Dallas, uh, Texas. I got this from him. I just stole it. I didn't come up with this. It's directly from him. He shares with people all the time. I'm second-hand in it, but it's really pretty cool, so I'm going to use it. AD 49, Paul is in what we now call Turkey. 51, he's in Greece. 52, Thomas, according to church tradition, goes to India, and there's evidence that he really did. Paul's third missionary journey, 54. 174, there's Christians in what we now call Austria. 280, there's Christians in North Italy. By 350, over half the Roman Empire claims Christianity, right? And I'm sure that not all those were like true Orthodox Christianity, but nevertheless, that's pretty big considering that the, one of the first leaders had his head cut off after being in prison. And that the first leaders, you know, a lot of them had met sort of the same end. 432, Patrick goes to Ireland. 596, Augustine, that's not St. Augustine, but Augustine, Archbishop of Canterbury, like it says. 596, 10,000, uh, two years later, there's 10,000 Christians in what we call, well, in Great Britain. By 635, Christians go to China. By 740, Irish missionaries go to Iceland. By 900, missionaries arrive in Norway. By 1200, the Bible is in 22 languages. By 1498, Christianity is spread to Kenya. And then, I, this is my part, let's go really fast. And then through all kinds of different people like Jesuits and other missionaries in the Reformation, modern missions movement, William Carey, you might have heard of him. Uh, English, man, that's way out of whack historically. Um, English Puritans, immigrants, Great Awakenings, Westward Expansion, Indianapolis. There you go. From Paul to Indianapolis in like two minutes. But it's true, right? I mean, I know it's, I'm a little bit tongue-in-cheek up here, but it's true. You're here. You're here, and it's directly related to the Apostle Paul and to Peter and to John and James. I'm not going to name all of them. Um, to them doing what? going out and telling people God kept his promise to Abraham. And you got blessed by that. And that doesn't mean you just got happy. It, mean, it means that God himself, the author of the story, the one who the story is really about, called you to take part in it and made you part of it. And so when you sit down to read your Bible, it's more than just a collection of verses. It tells you who you are. And it says, you, it says to you this, whatever your gifts are, whatever your abilities are, that's secondary. Because you can bring them all to the table and God will never look at you and say, you did all right, but did you see this guy? He really showed me something. God's going to be equally impressed with everybody. It's God. And he's never going to look at you and say, that was okay, but man, this guy over here, he really brought it. That's not how God works. We think God works that way because we work that way. But God doesn't because God's no respecter of persons. What does God look for? Faithfulness in the thing he's called you to do, not the thing that somebody else has been called to do. Now, the thing you've been called to do may change. It may change today. It might not. On one level, it doesn't matter because the calling is the same. Faithfulness to the story, faithfulness to Jesus, God incarnate, regardless of who you are or where you're going or where you'll be tomorrow or whether you even have a tomorrow. And now here's the end. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That's how the story ends. That's the same story, by the way, that starts with Abram. The same one. Remember? Through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Well, there they are. Where? Gathered around the throne of the Lamb. And we'll all be there. In one voice. Doing what? Praising. Praising the one who... The one who's at the heart. The one who is the story. It's not just about him. He is it. And so there's back to the Great Commission. Now, this is me, as I, as I wrap up, let me just sort of explain how I got involved in missions. It, it wasn't like a, well, I'll just tell you, I was at church, good start, 
And church was over. I was walking down one of the aisles or something. And somebody tapped on my shoulder. And I turned around, and there was nobody there. Nobody. And then I turned around over here. He's standing on this side. He'd done one of those things where he taps one side, and you turn around, and there he was. <laughs> and, so there was no, and so there he was. I know you're like, wow. But that stuff rarely ever happens to me anyway. And so, and if it did, I would ask for three more anonymous taps before I'd believe it. Okay, so, seriously, I mean, you think Gideon was bad. I mean, I'd be, okay, let's do the fleece three more times, and maybe I'll believe it. Because that's just the way, I mean, I'm not, I'm just doubtful. I don't want to be, but I'm just confessing that I am. And so this guy, I turn around, it's a student that I know, and he says, hey, we've lost our team leader for the trip to India this year. Do you think you could do it? I thought, hmm, India, that sounds kind of cool. Yeah, I'll do it. And well, then I went home and talked to my wife about it, and, and uh, it seemed like a good thing to do. And I didn't really, honestly, it wasn't like a big, gigantic, spiritual breakdown moment. It was just an opportunity to go to India and lead a trip that was already going. And so I just took that opportunity and went. And I was looking forward to it. I was, I was grateful for it. But then I went, and all of a sudden... All of a sudden, I started to think sort of differently about this sort of story in the Bible. And one of the reasons is this. I met a guy called Mursad. He was a, a Muslim background believer who had been almost beaten to death by his father and his brothers. Now, before you think, oh, those Muslims, don't think that way. This is not about what happened to him. What, this is not about his family. But he had been almost beaten to death, and then nearly died a second time because his wife tried to poison him slowly by putting poison in his food that his father gave to her. And uh, he had big sort of cuts, like scars that hadn't healed and all kinds of stuff. And, and uh, I was talking to him, and he, he was telling me how his, his wife had come to faith um, because of his faithfulness. And I said, and he said, can you, can you pray for me? I said, man, brother, can you pray for me? And he said, no, I, I really want you to pray for me. I said, okay, yeah, what? And he said, well, sort of three things. One, and he said, you have to understand, this isn't necessary, but could you pray that, that God can make it possible for my family and I to have a roof? A roof? Like, not like that kind of roof. And I was just stunned. And I thought, well, yeah. He's like, because now we just have a tarp over part of the house and it's okay. He said, we know we can stay, but it would be nice if we, if we could be dry all, all in the house. I immediately thought about myself and thought, if I didn't have a roof, before it occurred to me to pray about it, I'd be on the phone demanding a new roof from somebody. Because a roof, I have a right to it. Right? I don't, but I think I do. I think I do because of where I live and where I came from and how I live. I think, of course I have a roof. I take it for granted I have a roof. It's a right. It's a human right. No, it isn't. It isn't. So I started to think about the way I think about stuff like my roof, like I'm entitled to it. And he said, I'd also like to have a camera. I said, you mean like a digital camera? He's like, no, just an old camera so we can take pictures of these private baptisms we do, that we, we do in private, and then people can keep a picture as a reminder. And they can show it to people when they're sharing their story with people in, Muslim, in, their, in their villages. These are all Muslim background people. And so he wants a camera, not a digital camera. Just an old camera. They can develop the pictures and people can keep a picture of their baptism so they can use it as a witness. And he said, the third thing is this. Pray that I'd be able to get back to my village and share the gospel. That was missions for him. Because it wasn't really on his radar to think, well, I need to go to Mongolia. And that's great to go to Mongolia. But see, for him, it, it wasn't even possible. It wasn't even an idea because it just it wasn't, it just couldn't be. But what do you want to do? He wanted to take the Great Commission back to the place where he'd almost lost his life twice so he could share the gospel with him. And it dawned on me, and right after that conversation, I was like, wow, that's missions. I'm thinking, man, look at me on a mission trip, doing all these missions. Well, that guy's living it every single day. But not because he sort of views himself in a particular way with a particular calling, but because he wants to share that story with others. And that's, that's really all I want to leave, leave you with. I just want you to to be thinking about how this really defines who we are and shows us who we are. And you can just be you. I know, I mean, I know you've, you've, 
you have sin and anxiety and temptations. I'm not, I'm not saying just let those things go and don't worry about it. But what I mean is you can be you the way God made you to be. And you don't have to be the person beside you. You can just be the person God made you to be and figure out how you can bring those gifts and abilities and the story, which is your story, to bear for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And maybe that will take you to the other end of the world. But maybe it will cause you just to knock on the door of the apartment beside you or to walk across the street or to take a meal over to somebody who's suffering or just to offer to help somebody and then get to know them and share your... Who knows? Any number, as many possibilities and more as there are people in this room. Why? Because God made a promise to a guy called Abram centuries ago, and he kept it. Let's pray. Father, I pray that this would be more than just words to us, but this would be life. And we'd see ourselves in it. Not because we have a a lot of information or know a lot or have a lot of facts, Lord, but that we would understand that you're a God who makes and keeps promises and they never fail. So I pray, Lord, that we will, you will bless us by helping us to keep our eyes and take our eyes off ourselves and put our eyes on the world around us, the nations around us, so that we can continue taking this promise of blessing to the nations through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.